Hello and welcome to webinar one in the Why Rethinking Pain Really Matters series. Towards the end of the event, you'll hear reference to a questionnaire evaluation and your feedback is really important to us. It's how we get to understand what's helpful, what isn't and what we can do better. That survey is still live and we'd really appreciate it if you could spare five minutes to complete it. You'll find the link below this video and also via the QR code on your screen just now. So if you hover your phone camera over that QR code, it'll take you straight to it. Thanks again and enjoy the webinar. Hello and welcome to Flipping Pain. Good morning. My name is Ruth Barber and I'm a person living with persistent pain. I am delighted to be here today to steer the ship that is this event. It is, however, my maiden voyage, and so let's keep everything crossed that it is smooth sailing. Flipping Pain is a public health campaign at improving persistent pain and the understanding of persistent pain. As part of this event, we'll be hearing a presentation from Professor Lorimer Mosley, followed by a question and answer session where we'll also be joined by Ian Robb and Stacey Wilson, who both live with persistent pain themselves. Healthcare professionals from across Scotland, clinical psychologist Nina Cockton and pain consultant Steve Gilbert will also be here for your questions. Just a reminder to please use the question and answer box to ask any questions for the panel discussion. Please note, however, that the panel can offer any specific advice on individual medical conditions. Except for the speakers, all the cameras and microphones are turned off throughout this event. And just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the event has finished. In case you've ever been made to feel um, anything otherwise, I'd like to acknowledge that persistent pain is real, it's complex, and as I definitely know, it is often distressing. It can make us feel quite scary, angry maybe, anxious, depressed even, and ultimately not in control. And sadly, there's a lot of misinformation out there that can add to this feeling. The aim today then is to share with you the most accurate information and so that you can begin to feel in control again. What you hear today won't take your pain away but it may start you on the right path to reclaiming back your life again, reclaiming you. Um, and you might be wondering why I can say that with such certainty, with such conviction. I can because 16 years ago, I was being guided by a very supportive team of health professionals to learn why my pain was persisting. Uh, my pain story is, is fairly unremarkable. Um, I had a minor injury, but it had a pretty major impact on my life. I jumped from a stage when I was 29 and I jumped from this stage onto a fantastic flashing dance floor. Think something out of Saturday Night Fever. Um, I'm 46 now. I'm maybe no better to do that again. And I may or may not have injured my hamstring. And when I was in the depths of my pain, I, I was really darkness. I was despair. I was very isolated and alone with this sensation of hot barbed wire wrapped around my thigh and my pelvis. And I desperately sought hope. I sought hope of how to manage a life with this sensation. And I say it was unremarkable, but what is definitely not remarkable was that I was able to move from the place of darkness. I was able to find a place of living, a place without fear. I normally cry when I'm saying that. I can feel, feel myself shaky, but I've not cried yet. I've come to realise that um, through information like you hear today, that persistent pain doesn't seem to care whether the cause was remarkable or not. In fact, the longer the pain persists, the less and less the cause of it, if there was one, has any significance on how the pain behaves. Now, I was fortunate I attended a fantastic pain management programme, and it's just one of the support services available to people in pain to help reclaim back their life. My story, 
and that of both Ian and Stacey, accompanied by the expertise of the pain specialists on the panel today, just may bring hope to you in the audience. I hope that it may help you, I really do, or at least encourage you to be open to learning about pain, which may bring about a positive change. Managing my pain over the last 16 years, it hasn't taken my pain away, but I do live my life. I raise a family and I live in a life where pain is not consuming me or deafening me. Today, we have the great honour of hearing from Professor Lorimer Mosley, who is all the way around the world in a much sunnier climate, I'm sure, than I am here in rainy Glasgow. In fact, the rain is battering the window in front of me. And it was a book actually written by Professor Mosley that was the first introduction that I had to understanding why my pain was persisting. I have it next to me. I don't know if I should admit this, Lorimer, but it's scribbled all over. It's got questions all over it. And they were written in a very stubborn voice, a voice that at that time wasn't willing to accept that pain was part of my life. Learning about pain, though, was a catalyst for me. It was a catalyst that allowed me to learn to live with pain. And I am sure without a shadow of a doubt that hearing Lorimer speak today will be a catalyst for change for many of you watching and listening. I I'm delighted and can't wait to hear Lorimer present to us now. Lorimer, can I press, um, pass over to you? Wow. Uh, thanks so much, Ruth. Do you have me? Am I am I live and visible and audible? Got a nod. Uh, what a privilege it is to be coming to the the offices and the bedrooms and lounge rooms of of Scottish people. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, I am sitting here actually in in my daughter's bedroom in my house that sits on Ghana land. The Ghana people have been uh, living in this part of the world for tens of thousands of years, and I pay my respects to the Ghana people, uh, to First Nations people everywhere, elders, past, present and future. It's really important when you do a job like I do uh, that you guys all know, just got to work out how to go forwards, uh, what's in it for me? So as a scientist and a, uh, and I guess an educator, it, we, we try our hardest to adopt full transparency. So this is the stuff I have to do. I get royalties from books such as the book that Ruth has spoken about. No matter how much you write on it, I still have received a royalty. I've also received uh, support for travel uh, or possibly for money uh, from these organisations. So uh, they're the, the ones that are relevant to tonight. If you're, uh, if you're turned off by any of those organisations, I encourage you to hang around. Uh, the one in blue is Connect Health, which is uh, in charge of the Flip and Pain campaign. Uh, I get fees for tonight, which go into Pain Revolution, which is a, a non-profit movement that we run here in, in Australia. But isn't it intriguing that a an, an Aussie from the literally, maybe not quite literally, but the other side of the planet might get asked uh, to do a gig like this? And I was trying to work out why is that so? So I, I did a bit of research and I came across this guy. So this guy, Peter Dodds McCormick, he grew up at Port Glasgow. Uh, he was there for the first 22 years of his life, gained an apprenticeship and then thought he would explore the world and found himself as the principal at Fort Street School in Sydney. Now, it just so happens that 150 years later, these two young children attended Fort Street School. Now, I know these young children very, very well, and you might be able to see the re resemblance there with the, the great posture of my daughter, Charlotte, and the confident smile of my son, Henry, now some of the uh, strategies at Fort Street School remained quite draconian actually, and uh, we had to make a very rapid escape uh, from Fort Street School and we made our way over to Adelaide where uh, I currently live. But let's, let's learn more about this guy, Peter Dodds McCormick. Now, Peter Dodds McCormick uh, was famous in the end for writing songs. And this is, this is his second most famous song, The Bonnie Banks of Clyde. Now, if someone knows this song, I'd, I'd love for you to be singing this tune to yourself. Uh, this, I hadn't heard of this song, but I've definitely heard of his other 
more famous song, and that is Advance Australia Fair. Advance Australia Fair became our national anthem. You may have heard uh, a group of footballers trying to sing this, but you may have realised that Australians don't sing very well. Uh, but clearly there's this connection, right, with Scotland uh, and Australia. And, he, and if I look more deeply at this, Peter Dodds McCormack, his second name Dodds, uh, is intriguingly uh, the same as that of Sir Lorimer Dodds, a very famous pa paediatrician, photographed here in 1970. And you might notice a newborn baby in his arms. This is in May 1970. This is newborn baby uh, with his mother, uh, which is, uh, her name is Janet Lorimer Mosley. She's my mother, same middle name as Sir Lorimer Dodds. It's getting more and more spooky. So I went exploring and we looked for, what's, what's this Lorimer name? And we followed this Lorimer name all the back, way back through history. And we found the earliest recording of our family, the Lorimers. Uh, in the record of the people who made the bridles for all the noble people who were attending the Treaty of Perth in 1266. So I think that might be why I've been invited to speak to you guys. It's probably why I've been leading this campaign, not with a lot of success so far, and it's got nothing to do with the fact that Scotland won the Calcutta Cup. Twice. Okay. What, what am I really here to talk about? Well, there's really three things that I'm going to focus on for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, you may not be familiar with the top word, it's bioplasticity, and I will, I will tell you what that means. You'll be very familiar with the words uh, protection and body and brain. Bioplasticity. In my view, bioplasticity is uh, my, it's my favourite thing about biology. Plasticity, so the plasticity part of it, refers to the ability to change. It's moldable, like, like plastic. So if you put pressure on it or you give it a demand or a challenge, it will change in response to that influence. Bioplasticity just refers to the ability of us to change, the property that we have in us to change. There are so many examples of bioplasticity. Uh, just walk through these yourselves. Uh, if you've ever learnt a new skill, and you all have, that's bioplasticity at work. If you get the flu, maybe you've had COVID and you've been in bed for a couple of weeks and you get weaker, you can't do as, uh, as, as much as you were doing beforehand, that's bioplasticity. The, the change is a negative change. We get, we get weaker with bed rest and with rest. We become stiffer as we do less. That's bioplasticity at work. That's a, that we could call that a negative change again. Our bones are changing shape. Archaeologists can uh, decipher what people did when they dig up their bones from thousands and thousands of years ago. They can work out whether they were manual laborers because of the shape of their bones. They can work out whether they walked on two feet or, or four because of the shape of, of their bones. And some of you will have noticed your own bones have changed shape. You have a, a larger lump under your knee where your, where your thigh muscles attach. That's bones changing shape because of bioplasticity. It's normal, it's excellent. If you look at a back X-ray, you'll see the vertebra change shape as we age because the bones learn to uh, take more load. So actually, we, our, our x-rays don't look like they did as 15-year-olds because of bioplasticity. It's, it's a beautiful adaptation to challenge. We develop habits. Uh, habits, that even if they're, they're bad habits or good habits, they, they only develop because of bioplasticity. We develop immunity to a virus. That's because of bioplasticity. We learn how to log into a webinar that's because of bioplasticity. We worry more easily. The, the amount that we worry and the ease with which we worry over time changes, that's bioplasticity. We develop a callus on a hand or on the back of your foot, bioplasticity. We get fitter, bioplasticity. So bioplasticity is the property that drives change. And how's this one? Growing new cartilage in an arthritic joint 
is an example of bioplasticity and this happens and you should come to the third seminar in this webinar because one of the world's leading experts on this and how we can grab this to improve the lives of people with osteoarthritis is giving that seminar. Her name is Professor Tash Stanton and do not miss it. Bioplasticity also gives us the cap capacity to recognise patterns and recognise them very, very quickly because we've been to exposed to them over time. So as soon as you saw this, you will recognise a few things, but most obviously you'll recognise these three people. And they're upside down, but you immediately know that they're people uh, and, and that wasn't difficult for you to do. That's because of bioplasticity that gave you that capacity. However, sometimes bioplasticity results in perceptions that are not a totally accurate portrayal of the truth. So what, which, what happens if my animation works when I turn this around? Now you realise that actually the, that exquisite capacity of your brain has made a mistake because you didn't realise when these are upside down that these faces all looked really odd. Your brain had made assumptions and had produced a perception based on all this stuff that it's learnt over the years of your life. So when we talk about vision, just the things that we see that we take for granted, that depends on information coming into our eyes, but also, and this is critical for pain, information already stored inside us, most obviously in our brain, but, but in all of us. What we see, so what we experience, depends on sensory data coming in, and information already stored. And that's one reason why rethinking pain really matters. Here's a really, uh, it, I think, a, a really compelling example of things that we see being influenced in ways that we don't realise at the time and, and, and we would never realise except for illusion. So this is an illusion. And if you look at these two squares, I always show these, these images. The square with A in it and the square with B in it, they should look different. So square A should look darker than square B. Now, if it doesn't look darker than square B to you, you are a very unusual person. Uh, even Scots experience this illusion. But if we take these two squares out to the side, we can see that actually they are exactly the same shade of grey but you don't see them as such because of data already stored inside you. If we do this another way, we just slowly cover up information, you can see, okay, this is not a trick that I'm playing on you. This is a, an illusion. So what happens here? Well, visual illusions are an excellent way for us to uncover what's going on in the brain when we experience things. And they, they're very straightforward because we can know exactly what we put in front of someone's eyes. So this sensory information goes in through the eyeball that you can see here. And now we understand that, that there is a very complex process that integrates that with all of the information already stored, as well as a whole lot of other sensory information coming in through your ears, through your nose, through your mouth, through your touch system. And what you experience at the end is a, is a best guess on what's going to be helpful for you in this situation. Let's think about pain. Now we know all this about vision and vision is, is uh, not emotionally compelling like pain is. Pain is the thing that makes us do something to protect ourselves. So when we think about pain, we, this is the uh, misconception that has been driving care for tens, maybe hundreds of years. And that is that, that it's called the old view of pain, that the reason you get pain in your toe when you tread on a drawing pin is very simple, that your, your toe detects pain and sends a message to your brain and it's a, a really simple event. The, the only way to treat this situation is to treat the toe, which makes sense. So if we were to put the old view of pain over to the side, just so I can demonstrate to you how different the new view of pain is, that's the way that, that most health professionals still think. 
unfortunately. It's the way that most people think about pain and it works a lot of the time. But when your pain persists, this idea of pain becomes a, a real problem because as Ruth has pointed out in that incredible story uh, and just kudos to you, Ruth, for for not just uh, your journey, but for, for sharing that journey here. I just think yeah, so much respect for people like you prepared to share that wisdom. When you thought pain worked like this, there was only one option. And when that option had been resolved, so in this situation, the drawing pins out of the toe and you still have toe pain. Now, no, you didn't have toe pain. There's nowhere else to go with the old view of pain, but the new view of pain is a lot more complex. Now, the point of this image is not for you to go through it and find all the things. The point of this image to say is to say this is a simplified version of our current understanding of how pain works. It's a simplified version of our current understanding of how pain works. This is a very complex system. And if you would like to know more about the kinds of things that we know influence pain, there's very good scientific evidence to show, then you should come to the second webinar because Professor Cormac Ryan, whose lovely dulcet tones you heard in the video before this started, he's going to focus on, on what, this message, which is one of the key messages of the Flip and Pain campaign, that everything happens when it comes to pain. And he's going to talk about why we can confidently say that. We are very interested in what is the impact of actually understanding this new way of this modern understanding of pain on outcomes? Now, Ruth has already told you that that, that was a key step. In the video at the start, Cormac has said, we now know understanding pain is a key step to recovering. So what sort of, what sort of information do we base these opinions on? Well, I'm going to give you just a little bit of science here. This is a published data set. So 1,600 people, uh, all of whom have chronic pain and have been treated uh, with, among other things, an education-focused intervention. And that group of people, if they were asked, what's your average pain over the last two weeks? They would say five out of 10. That was the average. That ranged from three to eight out of 10. These people had been diagnosed with uh, a whole lot of different conditions. M more of them had back pain than anyone else, but shoulder pain, arthritis pain, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, widespread pain, arm pain, complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS for short. So this is a very large group of, of people. And this is what changed over the course of a year in those people who learnt the modern view of pain. Now, this is not an easy thing to achieve, actually. And, and from what Ruth was saying, you, and you will identify with this, that this can be a very long journey of understanding and learning. In the people who rapidly learnt a modern understanding of pain and, and started to take on board these messages, the, the answer to that question, what's your average pain over the last two weeks, dropped significantly over the following year. Now, this is this is not happening overnight, but it's over a year. But this wasn't everyone. The people who didn't learn, who didn't change their understanding of pain away from that old, very simple model, didn't improve over that, that course of a year. I think this information, it tells us scientists one, one re and us, us health professionals one really important thing. So I know there are some health professionals on this call and my call to action is we need to be better at what we do, guys. We really do. We need to be better at explaining uh, respectfully and accurately the, the glorious new science of pain because we're not as good at it as we might think we are and certainly not as good as we can be. For consumers, for, for people whose lives are challenged by pain, this is a really profound finding because it demonstrates clearly that rethinking pain really matters. Hence the name of this series of, of webinars. Let's go back to this idea of bioplasticity because I think it's at the heart of all of these things. We actually can't stop changing. Change is happening all the time. Right now, change is happening in your brain 
in your immune system as you as you interpret and process information. And I said that right, in your immune system as you interpret and process information. In your body, in my arms, as I move my arms around, change is always happening. And we can't stop change happening, but we can change how we change. And that's where the opportunity with understanding lies. So hopefully you're open to the idea that rethinking pain really matters and it may really matter for you. The question then is, well, rethinking to what? What, what else can I know? I can't learn that really complex picture and you don't need to. We asked this question of 300 people a bit like Ruth. Uh, these are people who had recovered from chronic pain of over five years on average. So these are people who's, who have had a significant reduction in pain, but the main thing is they've had a significant improvement in their quality of life uh, and in their engagement, but they have also had reduction of pain. Uh, about 30% of them had become pain free. We asked them this question a year after they had uh, started engaging in, in a understanding and, and gradual change um, program. We asked this question, what was important for your recovery? So we're going to the true experts, the people who have recovered. What was important for you? And you won't be surprised on the basis of what Ruth has said. A very long process resulted in identifying four key themes in what people said. One, pain protects us and promotes healing. And when you read this, I want you to really read it because it, it should surprise you a little bit. Pain protects us and promotes healing. You might feel a bit annoyed when you, when you read that. Great, that means you're processing it. Persisting pain or persistent pain over protects us and prevents recovery. Many factors influence pain. And this is where hope lies in the fourth one. And this is, again, remember this is from consumers who have recovered. There are many ways to reduce pain and promote your own recovery. We call these the essential pain facts. So these are now at the heart of all of our education programs for people challenged by pain. And you'll notice uh, in, the, in those first two, the key is protection. The key is not detection of damage. Uh, none of these people volunteered, well, you know what was good for me is that I realised pain is detecting a problem in my tissues. Actually, no, they're not saying that. They're realising pain is protecting my tissues. Let me walk you through that. So this is essential pain fact one. Pain protects us and promotes healing. I want you to imagine this scenario, that you've gone into a, a laboratory, you've volunteered for a pain experiment, possibly in our laboratory, possibly in Cormac Ryan's laboratory over there. Uh, you've gone in and you've participated in an experiment where you put your finger in a finger squeezer. Now just imagine a finger squeezer. You put your finger in there and it puts pressure on you on your finger and you increase the pressure until you get pain of, let's say, three out of ten. You rate it three out of ten. And then in another situation, you put your finger in there and one of your friends puts the pressure down. And in a third situation, a stranger you've never met before puts the pressure down. Now, if the pressure is always the same, so the event is always the same, the old view of pain would predict, well, you'll have exactly the same pain in those three situations. But you will already be thinking, well, that's probably not right. How would this really work? Well, the modern view of pain would predict that it will hurt the least if you do it and the most if the stranger does it. The event is the same, but the risk and the need to protect are greater if someone you don't know is in charge of the force. So the modern view of pain says, how much will this defined thing hurt? How much will this particular injury hurt? Or how much will this uh, ligament strain hurt? Well, it depends. And it depends on a lot of things. Everything matters when it comes to pain because pain is about protection. So any information that says, yeah, protect, will increase pain. And any information anywhere coming into your system or already stored that says, no, no, you're safe, 
will reduce pain. It's as simple and it's as difficult as that. So pain serves a really important uh, function, and that is to protect tissues from exceeding their tolerance. So if we were to imagine activity as a mountain that you're climbing, pain provides a safety buffer so that if you're moving slowly and gradually uh, into more and more challenge, pain will stop you from reaching the problem. Now, this system doesn't work very well if you if the force is applied very, very quickly. For example, you jump off the stage at Saturday Night Fever and you, you injure perhaps your hamstring. That might have happened too quickly for the pain system to protect that tissue. Or it's happening very, very slowly. So some cancers are deadly because the changes occur so slowly that the pain system doesn't provide the safety buffer. The size of the buffer at any time depends on everything, every possibly relevant thing. When we do injure, so if we do have a little injury of the hamstring from Saturday night fever jumping off the stage, why does it hurt? Because most people, when they hear that idea that pain protects us from injury, they find that difficult because they know that, well, when I'm injured, it's painful. So pain is telling me I have an injury. Actually, that's another illusion. That's another trick. Because what happens when we injure is the whole system changes immediately in, a, in an extraordinary response to injury and inflammation. That safety buffer immediately expands and it can expand so far that even with a minor hamstring injury, you cannot even stand on that leg. So injury and inflammation expand the safety buffer. And what that does is make sure almost no forces go through the tissue that has to heal. So that's why when we are injured, everything becomes more sensitive. So essential pain fact one is that pain protects us and promotes healing. And that's how pain promotes healing. And healing is the second unstoppable force. So change is one and the second is healing. You cannot get in the way of healing unless you keep pulling tissues apart which none of us do in the normal situation because it hurts too much to put any force through them. So healing happens because of pain. But things start to change when pain persists. So persistent pain, and this is the, the second essential pain fact. Persistent pain overprotects us, overprotects the tissues. And because of that, it prevents recovery. Why is this so? bioplasticity. Exactly the same changes that happen when you learn a new skill or you develop a habit. Uh, you, you, you do grow a callus. All of these things that you don't necessarily willingly do, they change because of bioplasticity. So in the pain system, we learn. And this learning has been identified and scientists have, have gained a lot of understanding about how this learning happens. It happens inside the spinal cord where messages from your body first arrive, uh, very microscopic changes, but it becomes more sensitive. It happens in the bottom of your brain where information is processed. It happens in the front of your brain. It happens in the back of your brain. It happens in your immune system. It happens all over the pain production system. Now, where it happens for an individual will depend on the individual and their circumstances, their history, their type of injury, their behavior, their thoughts, their health care. Where it happens is different, but that it happens is consistent. So what this gives us is, is what we call pain system hypersensitivity. And you might notice that it looks very, very similar to the effect of injury and inflammation. Both of these conditions, pain system hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity, which occurs with persistent pain, and injury and inflammation, which occur after an injury, both result in a very big safety buffer. They feel the same. There are actually some differences with persistent pain that some of you will be aware of. The pain spreads, so it covers more of your body. It's more easily affected by things other than movement. It gets worse when you don't move. 
those sorts of things, they're different, but the pain itself, it feels the same. So when you have persistent pain, it feels like you've still got an acute injury or you're very inflamed. So even though they feel the same, their causes are different. And this means that we have to go about treating them differently. There's no point treating, trying to manage a situation of pain system hypersensitivity in the same way that we would manage a, a drawing pin through your toe or the acute phase of this injury and an acute hamstring strain, for example. The third thing I want to talk about is body and brain. So if we can see that pain system hypersensitivity is a big part of the problem, then we have to train the body and the brain. We have to train the entire system. Now this complexity makes life harder because it's not a simple quick fix scenario, but it also provides opportunity because the system has bioplasticity. So what is the aim then of of modern pain intervention for persistent pain. Well, the aim is to use bioplasticity, the, the known principles of bioplasticity, to return the safety buffer back to a normal setting, to remove that sensitivity. Now we have to train this over time and it can be challenging to do that. How do we make this journey? Well, I know that many of you are sitting on a waiting list uh, to, to engage with healthcare professionals who will be able to coach you through this journey. But the very first step we now know from very solid scientific studies is first understand pain, and I would say understand your pain. No pain, as in K-N-O-W, no pain and you will no gain. The system, this, this very complex system can be influenced in, in many ways and understanding your pain will help you identify how you can influence your own system. It might be quite different from how someone else will influence their system, but there are many, many access points to the system. Essential pain facts three and four really focus on, on that end of it. What are the factors that are contributing to your pain and how can you use these many influences to, to reduce your pain and slowly reduce the size of that safety buffer. So essential pain fact three says that many factors influence pain and Cormac will tell you all about this. Essential pain fact four says there are many ways to reduce pain and promote recovery and, and that's through using bioplasticity to reduce the size of the safety buffer. You, are, you will still be completely safe as Ruth could tell you. Uh, she's not pain free. A reminder, if that's, an, if that's an exciting opportunity to you, if that's a possibility that you might not have considered, or even if that's a possibility that you're open to learning more about, Cormac will tell you about it. I wanna finish now with a quote from someone called Jenny. 30 year old, 38 year old person who had an injury not unlike yours, Ruth. Uh, she had had 15 years of, of back pain, unable to work, very, very disabled by that. And this is something that she said, learning how the pain system hypersensitivity works. So she was asked, you know, what, what was important for you? Learning how pain system hypersensitivity works. It made total sense that I had pain when my back was actually safe. This was the game changer for me. And I would like, if you are challenged by pain, I would like you to just read this through again, particularly the middle sentence. It made total sense that I had pain when my back was actually safe. Now, if this doesn't make total sense to you, then I would say to you, start learning about it. Understand why this is a very solid, scientifically based perspective. So this is my call to action. If you are challenged by pain, my first call to action is learn more about how pain works, how it actually works, because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, and as Cormac said in that video, unfortunately, some of the fabulous science that's been coming for 40 or 50 years is still to make it to the cold front. 
to make it to some of the healthcare professionals that are working out there. You have to take control and start by learning about more about how pain works. This QR code, take out your phone, put it on your screen. This will take you to the Flip and Pain website resources section. And on that resources section, there are fact sheets, there's stories from other people who are on or have taken a recovery journey. Uh, and there's links out to a, a very comprehensive web of information around the world. This is not unusual stuff. Uh, it's happening all over the world where people are getting their lives back, but it's not through a quick fix. It's through understanding and taking control. So get the QR code. When you do get to see your health professional, you get to the top of that waiting list, or, or maybe you're lucky enough not to be with, uh, to be on one. Ask them what you can do to retrain your pain system hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity. Ask them that question, and if they look at you a little bit like a stunned mullet, maybe say to them, "You should check out the Flipping Pain website," or go and ask Ruth what the best book is. And my third call to action is come to the second webinar because Cormac will build on this uh, and I'm sure you will find it uh, hopeful uh, and full of opportunity. There's the Flip and Pain website that's there in the UK, flipandpain.co.uk. I mentioned at the front that uh, I'm part of a movement called Pain Revolution. It's a non-government, uh, non non-commercial, it's an NGO. Uh, we really deliver primarily to rural and regional e-based Australians, uh, this sort of stuff. That's down the bottom is Tame the Beast, just has a sort of fun animation that my children think is hysterical because there's an animated me and I don't have a neck. Uh, go and check that out. Thank you again for your time and uh, I think we're going to head to the Q&A. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Lorimer. Thank you, Lorimer. I know there'll be a lot to take on board there, and I know already there's loads of questions, um, both for you, Lorimer, and the rest of the panel. So as we move to the panel discussion, can I just remind you that the question and answer box is there to ask any questions and to allow everyone in the audience to direct your questions this morning. I'd like to invite the panel to introduce themselves. Our panel today consists of Ian and Stacey, people with lived experience of persistent pain, and they will no doubt be a really strong voice in answering the questions that are already coming through. And they are going to really add to this discussion, bringing, I suppose, like the nitty gritty of daily life and challenges and overcoming struggles that they've come across. Ian, can I start with you first? Remember to unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Ian. That's fabulous. Hi, everyone. I'm Ian. I live in East Ayrshire um, and I've been living with pain for severe pain for over three years now. Uh, I had the unfortunate experience um, of an industrial accident. Uh, it was a large magnetic drill that I was working with that had caught my clothing. It dragged my arm in and started crushing it by means of the material of my work jacket, uh, my welding overalls and my hooded top, my work gloves. They all get caught in the wrist, the cuff area. It was a large cutting milling bit in the machine. The machine was turning at the rate of 11.3 rotations per second. And I was trapped in the machine for between 8 and 12 minutes. Which means the machine turned the minimum equivalent of 5,400 and something times in my arm. I was affected both physically and mentally with the accident. And to this day, I'm unable to function properly. For example, picking up a remote control for the TV with my right arm, I can't do it. Um, and that's the exact reason why I'm here today. It's to discuss the matter of living with pain. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ian, and thanks for sharing what's quite a 
I'm sure took a lot of courage to share that and we'll hear a bit more from you um, in the discussion, I'm sure. Stacey, can I now come to you and remember just to unmute and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a teacher and uh, I've been living with chronic back pain since the birth of my daughter seven years ago. I don't actually know what specifically caused her why it happened, but I had like a few flare ups um, which I've now managed to kind of overcome and don't have um I haven't had one for four years, which has been great. I still have chronic pain every day, but my flare ups um, are a lot smaller. They used to leave me unable to walk for weeks at a time and couldn't do anything. So um, I went to the Edinburgh Pain Management program um, and I've had great success since I've managed to kind of think for pain and um, turn my life back around and, and be able to kind of get that normality back. So that's fine, um, yeah. Thanks so much, Stacey. And again, we'll hear a bit more, I'm sure through some of the questions. Um, we also have two healthcare professionals here with us this morning and I'll come first to Nina Stockton, clinical psychologist. Nina, would you like to introduce yourself further? Hi, I'm Nina. Um, I've been a clinical psychologist in pain management for about 10 years now. Um, it's a privilege to work with people managing the impact of persistent pain in their day to day lives. I don't see myself as an expert because I still feel like I'm, I'm learning every day, but I'm delighted to, to join you all in this Flipping Pain event. Thank you, Nina. And Finally, we have pain consultant Steve Gilbert. Steve, can you introduce yourself? Hi, Ruth. I'm Steve Gilbert. I'm a consultant in pain and anaesthetics, and I've worked uh, in pain management for about oh, 25 years now. Uh, in Scotland, I was over in Australia, at the other end of Australia, up in Townsville in the tropics until a couple of years ago, and moved back here to uh, the Highlands, which is just as beautiful, not quite as tropical. Uh, and uh, I think it's a fantastic area to learn more about pain uh, and to be able to get people involved from that early stage. So I'm really pleased to be involved with Flipping Pain. Thanks ever so much, Steve. And again, I'm sure you'll be contributing a lot to the questions. So we'll come to um, the first question that's coming through. And Lorimer, I'm going to come back to you, if that's all right, for this first question. Um, so Lorimer, you first talked about um, people who, who did learn and people who didn't learn. And someone's asking um, the people who didn't learn, uh, the kind of language of that, I suppose, um, has a sort of feeling of pushing the responsibility for the pain onto the individual suffering. So somebody's asking if they think that's fear. Lorimer, do you think you could maybe explain a little bit more around that? Yeah, that's that's a great it's a great observation actually. And it's um something that I'm aware of when I talk about those data, that that study. Um and if we had more time to focus on that study, the main I think the main message that that gives us is uh, that these are these are all uh, consumers who are participating in, among other things, in pain education and then uh, a, a, a graded return through active and psychological therapies and self-management skills. Uh, what those data tell us is that we're getting a, about a 50% hit rate as healthcare professionals. And we, when we look at that, we can understand, we're in a steep learning curve at the moment, realising that uh, our educational skills are a long way short of educational experts and a real push in the pain field, certainly in Australia and some of the organisations I work with in, in North America. The the push is we, we just need to be better health educators. So uh, I'm, I think it's a, a really important question because I, I don't, I really don't think that the explanation of that falls on the consumer. Uh, part of my conviction in that is that that we've we've got a lot of data on these people and and we can't tell them apart 
it's I think it's more likely that we're just not good enough at the at bringing understanding yet. As well as that, it, this is really difficult. It's really difficult stuff, and and there will be health professionals, uh, I'm sure, here on this webinar, who know it's difficult. We it's hard to get your head around ourselves, and it's hard to move away from our some of our biomedical training, uh, and. Uh, yeah, I think I think we've got a long way to go as health professionals before we we have full coverage uh, of of just thinking in this in this way, and I I really don't want to give the impression that uh, you know you learn it and a year later you'll be better. That's not true. That the data don't say that actually. Um, what the data say is that that for the people who who had this shift in how they understood pain, and there are so many contributors to that, they had good outcomes. Uh, and when I say good, they were they they really had a better life was the main primary outcome of that. So I th I, I really want to take my hat off to whoever asked that question because it's mm -hmm. it's a really important one, uh, and. I think the take home message should be for healthcare professionals as strongly as it is for anyone else, um, that we've got to get better at this. And 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 people like me, the scientists and the researchers have got to find better ways of assisting healthcare professionals and healthcare systems to make this information very accessible and very applicable. Um, mm -hmm. So we are on a steep learning curve for us and we actually are turning to consumers, to, to people like you, Ruth, to guide us in that. Thank you, Lorimer. And I think I just want to also kind of reiterate that it definitely is not an overnight thing. This is not, you know, as you've said, it's years. And I, I even know myself, it, it changes the more I learn about one thing, I then can live better and then might take a wee stumbling block and then learn more. And you're always learning all the time. It's always a kind of pain journey, as it were, that's changing all the time, just as your life is changing. So I, I just want to reiterate what you're saying there about it. it's it's definitely a, a time period in order to do that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to come to um, both Ian and Stacey with the next question, if that's all right. Ian, I'll come to you first and then um, we'll hear from Stacey as well. Um, there's a question has come up around the word recovery. Um, and, and I know myself, I've been in both your position, Ian and Stacey, answering this question. So I'm also really interested to hear this. Um, and it's about, <clears throat> I suppose, should we maybe qualify the word recovery? You know, what is recovery when we have persistent pain um, and, and people listening today, you know, thinking, does recovery mean no pain whatsoever or does recovery mean I, I would definitely think it's about being able to live my life in pain? Um, so, Ian, do you want to maybe share first around what you would maybe have your experience of what you think recovery is or other words that you feel um, that you use for yourself in terms of your life and living with pain and managing your pain? Well, I can say that I'm actually still recovering and mm -hmm. I dare say it will continue on. Um, but the stages that you go through at the very, very start are so overtaken, you don't have much of a say in it. Uh, your total mind and body is controlled with the pain. And until you can actually find the likes of a distraction, or something that you can take your mind away from the pain, apart from the medicine. The, the, I must admit, like the medicine that you use, you must get to know it. You must fully understand it. Because if you don't fully understand that, you cannot help yourself with painkillers if you don't know what they're doing. I try and stick to, I'm not saying everybody should do this, but I try and stick to a routine of 8, 12, 4 and 8. And then nighttime pills after that, and in between pills in between it. But my main painkillers, I've kept them at that for a long time, and I find that so benefiting. But there's so many stages that's involved with it. You need to take a wee step back, relax, and have a look at your own situation. Because if you don't look at your own situation, then you won't understand it. And if you can't understand that, you can't help yourself. And it must come down to you helping yourself. No, no other person on the planet can do it except for you. 
um, I hope that helps in some mm. sort of way. That's and that's so important. I think both you, Ian, you've said that about understanding yourself, and Lorimer mentioned that as well. But you know, everybody is different, and every pain will be different. My experience is completely different from your experience. But thanks so much for sharing that. And is there any kind of uh, you mentioned you know medication but are there other um things that you find helpful on your recovery if you want to call it that things that you use to help to manage your pain uh, definitely um I, I was unfortunate it was my dominant right hand that got it and my right arm so that was it again so i've had to try and relearn my left hand slightly but i've found distractions with going online and playing solitaire uh, drafts, chess, um, anything that can take your mind away from it instead of just thinking all the time about the area of pain because it, mm -hmm. at the point where you've got your medicine into you, you will still lack in time to actually calm the pain down. Uh, there's going to be, for me, it's after the third hour, the fourth hour is ridiculous, it's distracting, it's unbearable. And to try and find something to occupy your mind just to take that distraction away, where you go and make some tea, where you can walk, if you go we walk, whatever you can do to distract yourself and make you feel more relaxed. Mine personally is going to my back window with a cup of coffee and sitting looking at the back window and watching the birds. I know, quite mad, quite mad but hey, hey, hey oh, it works. No, um, great. Uh, so I hope that helps. Yeah, so definitely finding things then that are good for distraction for you, you find is helpful. Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing that. Uh, Stacey, can I come to you then with the same question? So looking at um, this word recovery and what it would mean to you, Stacey, I'm sure it will be different for all of us. Um, and just how you think of recovery or another word, maybe, um, Stacey, do you want to give us your experience? Yeah, sure. Um... I don't know if I like the word recovery because I think okay. it's like a, an end thing in, in a pain management world. Well, that's not really a thing for me. Like you're not going to have a full recovery. There's not going to be back to normal. There's no thing that's a, a thing to accept for me. Obviously, as you said before, it's, just, it's different for everybody. I think for me, you need to be in the right position. You need to not be frustrated as much, you need to not be angry at other people, you need to look inward and think how am I going to then be in my brain, how am I going to look at research. Um, I was lucky enough to eventually get on the pain management programme, had actually been rejected three times I think in total it was because I didn't qualify, um, I don't know how, but I didn't qualify to get on to it and I eventually got onto it and I was um, told about getting a toolbox, so kind of filling my toolbox with things that work for me. So I tried everything, it was all about trying things, and, and if it didn't work for you, then it's not for your toolbox. So, you know, mindfulness initially worked for me, and I found that being a PE teacher and, and being in touch with like kids and things, and, and then spreading that mindfulness as well has helped me because the more I talk about it and the more I help educate other people. That also helps me understand things better about my pain and about my body, about how I move and things. So, kind of mindfulness and being active in a different way. So, I didn't say my intro, but I used to do athletics and I threw in a, a, a day of weightlifting. Um, and obviously, once the chronic pain kind of came in, doctors were really like, no, not to say anymore. And it was the given place of I'm not able to do that anymore, so I can't do that. So really kind of, what can I do? Or I'm thinking, going, mm, that's not working for me. That's not being kind of adaptable and trying out lots of different things. And I am too. Um, and that's kind of thing right now. But when I still get massive flares, my, my flare tool is completely different. So it might have been my flat in my bed, but I have insurance playlists. Um, Having certain things that my support system and family um, could bring in, like certain foods or like um, films that I could watch for people that would come and visit me, um, that would help. But that's kind of where I'm in terms of recovery. I don't think about as recovery, I think about as kind of 
maintain a, an even keel and, and get back to a new normal. OK. Um, thanks. Thanks, Stacey. I, I'm aware that your sound is a little bit distorted, so I'm going to try and kind of just reiterate a little of what you're saying. So apologies if I don't get it quite right, but just for people listening, just so they can. So in case you can't hear Stacey, she's saying um, that she was able to go to uh, a community pain management programme um, and that she's finding different ways of doing things. I think you were mentioning athletics um, and using mindfulness. Um, and Stacey was saying about, in, just in case you couldn't hear her, um, about perhaps the word recovery is not a word that she would use herself um, for her own um, a journey as she's coming through. I, I think I'm picking up on everything, Stacey. Apologies if I've missed a few wee bits and pieces. Um, so the next question is actually uh, coming through in quite a few different ways. And Steve, I'm going to come to you for this question, if that's all right. Um, so quite a lot of people asking and also um, in different ways about this idea of a modern view of pain and whether this would refer to other chronic unwanted sensations or whether this would refer to things like um, fibromyalgia, things like flares, those kind of things. Um, so Steve, I wondered if I could come to you um, on that to see if this um, idea of a modern view of pain refers to other chronic um, either unwanted sensations like burning, tingling, itching, or whether it refers, it can also be relevant to things like fibromyalgia. Steve, can you give us your experience around that? Well, thanks, Grace. I mean, I think that's uh, really important is that, um, you know, I started off in pain medicine as an anaesthetist uh, and mainly thinking of pain in a biomedical way, thinking about whether I could do an injection to block the pain signals going along the nerve uh, or uh, in medical school, we would learn about um, looking for the pain as a source of uh, or as a diagnostic tool to find uh, some underlying organic disease. And for many people with persistent or chronic pain, that's not the case. That there's, uh, as Lorma mentioned, that there are changes in the way that our scans look uh, as we get older. And we see just about the same amount of changes in people's MRI scans, whether they've got pain or not. And so I think that more and more uh, people are getting that idea that it's the way that things are working. Uh, and that's a mind and body thing. It's a, what we might say in medical terms, a biopsychosocial, so the biological bit with uh, nerve signaling, muscle tightening, maybe joint loading and things like that. There's how it makes you feel and uh, that's maybe psychological and how, how you feel affects how your pain is. Um, uh, as we were hearing earlier, if you're thinking about it all the time, then I can make it worse. And then there's the social side of things, what you how it's changed uh, your life and your your meaning of uh, uh, of things that you used to be able to do and maybe can't do now. Uh, so I think that um, taking this balanced view of the person and the way that pain affects their mind and body is really, really important. And I think it's really important for us as well, rather than thinking about medical, psychological, social as separate things for us to think of, of it all together. So I really want to try and be a multidisciplinary practitioner, uh, working with specialists in the multidisciplinary team as well. But I want to be able to offer all that sort of perspective to a patient as well as saying, now I've done the drug bit or the uh, intervention bit, and then you go and see the psychologist or the physio or, or so on. And uh, I think that uh, you might notice my pain toolkit t-shirt uh, that uh, uh, resource from Pete Moore looking at how patients uh, or people with pain can start building up the tools that they need to start tackling how pain is affecting their life uh, and how it's affecting how they're feeling uh, is a really good way to, to go. So I often use that with patients at the start. I don't know if that answered the question. That's fine. That's great, great amount of information there. You must have read my mind. I was just about to mention your pain toolkit t-shirt. So 
Brilliant. And, and we have the information on that um, at the end for people so they can access that. Um, thanks ever so much, Steve. Uh, Nina, I'm going to come to you next with um, a question which actually reading the question out makes me feel quite tearful because I definitely um, resonate with this question that's coming. So Nina, um, someone's asking around when feelings are quite overwhelming related to pain um, and just I suppose still feeling upset, feeling angry, um, feelings around kind of why me after quite, you know, a, a fair amount of time. Um, and, and when feelings kind of get very overwhelming, I suppose, how do people accept that or how do they deal with overwhelming feelings? Nina, could I, could I ask you to, to comment on that and answer that question? Sure. Um, and I, I would start off by saying that that is by no means uncommon because mm. Persistent pain is just pain is just horrible, isn't it? You know, it 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 naturally evokes a distress response in us, and that that's part of the challenge. And if it's if it's persistent and you're struggling with it every day, then you know that there is a, a kind of overwhelm. That can certainly be an overwhelm element to it. And you know, learning to to find ways to to kind of adjust and accept are things that can happen over time but it, that isn't in itself is a journey and you know what 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 saying from all of this is that everything matters so that when you're distressed and overwhelmed it has an impact on other areas of your life on relationships on work on family so you feel more distressed and because pain is an output of the brain when your brain's feeling overwhelmed and stressed out then pain becomes more difficult to manage and we know that all of these factors can actually amplify pain signals too so that it, it ends up in a in a kind of feedback cycle of the, the pain itself causes distress but then the distress that you feel impacts on everything else that kind of suffering around the pain and the emotional responses to it can then amplify it and you know there isn't there's no quick fix but there are strategies to try and turn the volume down on on that that amplification, that response to pain. And that's often about learning strategies to process, to manage, to um, to work through emotions. It's not always about burying them or trying to distract or trying to push them down. Um, and sometimes we flip between that, pushing emotions down and burying them and then feeling overwhelmed when they come up. And a lot of the kind of psychological approaches and mindfulness approaches now are about trying to kind of sit a little bit more in that middle ground to make space for what we're feeling. So perhaps recognising that when we're feeling sad, that we're just fed up with pain and angry and you know very conscious of the impact that it's had and, and wish we could have a magic wand and take it away then yeah we feel frustrated and we feel irritated and we feel sad and actually making space to acknowledge some of those feelings and to process them to to talk about what we're feeling and um, you know can, can often help turn, turn some of that suffering bits down a little bit, doesn't magic it away, but it's about having strategies to deal with unpleasant, difficult feelings in addition to, to pain. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, nod, I'm nodding furiously because I, I, I know that situation myself of where the suffering perhaps takes over from the actual pain itself. And I know I found having support from a psychologist very similar to yourself was very helpful to be able to help me deal almost with the suffering rather than um, you know the, the the physical side of pain that that and um, the suffering kind of took over from that. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, I, I'm going to kind of keep keep with you just now because this is kind of related in that question if that's all right um, and then come to both Ian and Stacey who's now on the phone so we should be able to hear her a little bit better and um, just a kind of I suppose related question in terms of kind of un unlearning pain so someone's asking around and um, they've kind of been telling their body for months now at, at things like I'm safe and that the pain is not not dangerous it's just a bodily sensation but but how how do you unlearn the pain and I know you You've sort of alluded to that a little already with the strategies, but if there's anything you want to add further to that before I come to Stacey and Ian. I think my way of looking at it wouldn't be to think about unlearning the pain, but to think about building up things around 
in your day to day life that matter to you, that are meaningful for you, that improve quality of life, that improve well-being. So a kind of shift of focus and um, one um, kind of video I find very helpful in kind of putting that across is by Tamar Pincus, the psychology professor at Royal Holloway. And she has a lovely video on YouTube called Pain and Me about pain being a coloured blob of plasticine within a different coloured blob of plasticine. And sometimes you can't take that blob of pain out, but the more life you pack in around the pain, it it kind of improves well-being. And when well-being improves, we know people manage pain better in their lives. So I don't think about it as unlearning stuff, but maybe about shifting a focus on what can I put in my week, my my management, whether that's pacing, activity management, whether that's connecting socially for things that have drifted off my radar a little bit. So thinking about what matters to each individual and what kind of things they can reconnect with that make them feel more like them. Mm -hmm. So changing the focus away from the pain. And so almost this idea of rather than managing the pain in life, it's managing life around pain, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Nina. Um, Ian, can I come to you to kind of maybe talk about any of your experiences with that? I know you've talked about distraction as, as a helpful thing, but is there anything that you use to kind of reassure yourself this idea of I'm safe and the pain is not dangerous and just a bodily sensation and anything that you feel you could add on your experiences, Ian? Well, uh, the pain is certainly... It, it puts such a pressure on you. Sometimes, mm -hmm. some people, you, you're in a position you can't disregard it. It's always there, and it's that that brings your mindset into it. I mean, I've been, I've been actually stuck in. I've been housebound with it. Um, I actually managed to go to the top shop for um, just a little bit of messages. Um, I got in, and I'm, a, I'm no overconfident, I don't think, but I'm confident enough to at least manage that task. And when I went in, the person that was serving was going a bit slow for me. There was a person in front of me and two people behind me, and I took a massive panic attack. I haven't really told anybody about it, uh, but that's what happened. It came in left, right and centre. The full place just started bubbling. I just downed tools, dropped the wee basket that I had out the door in Oski. The next day I went back and I went up to the person that was serving me and I apologised for what had happened. Um, I, in that particular moment in time, I couldn't have faced anybody and I hadn't even cried for years and years. But yet, after the injury, the mental effect, the, the feeling of low, low, your lowest low as can be. And I, I broke down, I fluff constantly for a good year and a half. I'm not so bad now, the water taps have run out, I think. But apart from that, I'm not so bad now with that side of it. But I have, what I have found is, Communication is absolute key if you want to move forward at all to help yourself. You need to be able to tell people what's wrong with you and you need to communicate so that you can learn through their advice. Some of it might not suit you. Some of it will. Take the good bits and gaze them and hold on to them. See all the negative stuff, all the toxic stuff. Bolt. Get them all away. You don't want that. Only be with negative about you. Either tell them to their face, just to take a step to the side, you need some time out, or just avoid them. Either or, make sure your own personal self is seen to first, because you are not going to get out on such a low position until you actually take that on board. And it's took me a long time to realise that. If I had knew that at the start, I'd maybe I'd been a wee bit better for it. And no, actually still struggling at times. But I'm so fortunate. I've got a great team around about me. I can pick up the phone if I'm having troubles and I've got them there and I can only thank them very much for that. They all know who they are. Um, and I hope I've answered that in some amount. Good. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. And that, I mean, I, I'm feeling myself that that's, you know, it's really hard to share. And thank you so much for 
kind of being so honest and sharing that. Um, and I just want to sort of pick up on that idea of communication. It's one of the things, you know, I did a pain management programme and to learn how to communicate assertively as opposed to being able to ask something. And then for me, it was bursting into tears because I felt like you were asking too much um, and should be able to do it almost. So thank you so much. That I, I know that will have been, you know, probably really hard to share but really good for people to hear and to listen to thank you so much sure. um stacy can i come back to you hopefully you're with us on the phone now i think so if we can come to you and if i can just ask it um again that same question around the idea of kind of i suppose telling yourself you're safe and how to deal with maybe overwhelming feelings around the pain stacy are you with us yeah, hopefully. Oh, is that, uh, yes, <laughs> that's excellent. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Brilliant. Um, so in terms of um, time scales and things, I think that hopefully managing to, to not think, oh, this has been happening for this length of time or oh, this, because I used to be, my thing, be like, this has been happening to me for a year. Why is this not fixed yet? This has been, ha why, why is nobody taking me seriously? Why people think I'm making this up? Or like, oh, just go to a chiropractor or just go to this or go and try that. or go, You know, as Ian had said, it's kind of toxic, it's negative, it's not helpful. Um, so for me, again, I was lucky enough to, I was persistent with my persistent pain and I was on and on and on until I eventually got kind of the help that I needed, which for me was similar to you in terms of the kind of psychological help, because obviously physically I kind of had a bit of knowledge myself. Um, and in terms of kind of rethinking things and and trying to keep the positives and not focusing on the negatives and and opening up conversations with people, but kind of being kind to myself as well. So not ignoring the pain, but being kind also about other people, because I, I think I was possibly quite toxic in the way that I thought. So I was a bit like me, 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 me. You know, it's not just about me, but then it's also not other people's fault. So like, I'd be like, oh, why have my work people not phoned? You know, I've been in this house for two weeks, stuck, not been able to move. Why, why has nobody spoke to me? Because other people have a life as well. <laughs> They've got stuff going on too. So those kind of toxic conversations that you have in your own head when you're going through a massive peak in your pain aren't helpful. And it takes being in the right position and the right time for that to come about. So not worrying about time frames and, you know, I've had this pain for so long or, you know, trying to, as, as you were saying before, fill your life with the good things and finding the good things because they might not be the same good things as you were able to do before. And grieving the fact that, you know, you, you can't do the thing that you did before. Do you know what? I'm going to find something. I couldn't move. So I, I taught myself to knit. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like, so I would never have thought, you know, in my 30s and I, I was like, right, I'm going to start knitting. But keeping myself busy, trying to find a new hobby, trying to find something I can do. And then when physically those things got better, finding new things that kind of entertained me a little bit more than, than I was before. And then before you know it, loads of times passed and you've not been counting the time and then your pain has got better without you even noticing it because pain isn't, isn't you. You aren't pain. Pain is just part of your life. So that was kind of a big thing for me. Mm. And, Thank you so much, Stacey, and especially that idea of being kind to yourself. Um, something I always say to my family, I've got enough misery to deal with and not going to do things that I find miserable, so I'm not going to mop the floors and do all <laughs> rotten housework. Um, thank you so much. I know it's, it's, it takes a lot of courage and bravery to share um, stories. And just in terms of bravery, Laura, but I, I'd actually like to just sneak in a wee question there because it, it is brave of um, Ian and Stacey to share what they're going through and it's brave of people asking questions as well. And uh, Laura, I, I'd probably like to ask, I'm being a bit cheeky here, sneaking in my own question, but I, I've heard, you know, you, Laura, you talk about bravery being this kind of key almost to recovery if we want to use that. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, it, it's fine to talk about your experiences maybe once you've been through everything and you feel brave um, but being brave when you're feeling really vulnerable really distressed is quite a real act of courage what, what are the kind of thoughts about digging deep and bringing out bravery that's within 
Lorna, am I, am, I, am I being a bit cheeky asking you that question about bravery? <laughs> Uh, no, not at all cheeky, okay, Ruth. Um, but I, I, I just think it's it, it, it's a word that is you know can be quite um, it, it's great when you have the bravery, but when you don't have it, it's quite a trigger word, I think, and difficult to sure. to find that bravery. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's yeah, all all three of you guys are. are you know, you like the personification of courage. Uh, we have a we have a phrase that um, is is front and center in in our work with clients, and that is that this this journey requires um, patience, persistence, courage, and a, a really good coach. Uh, and uh, the I occasionally would say, yeah, be brave, but I, but I actually think the um, uh, Stacey, something you were saying, I think actually, Ian, uh, you touched on this as well, that the uh, the the acknowledgement of your vulnerability and Ian, you spoke about communicating. Uh, and I think um, the that bravery is is for many people who are in uh, a situation that Nina you said is it it's horrible it, it and I don't think anyone outside of the, outside of the lived experience of this will will really appreciate it uh, how horrible it is mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to articulate that and not have a clear uh, you know clear biomedical explanation for it creates I think creates a, a more a more brutal situation because you, you're dealing in a system that uh, is looking looking for that structure uh, I mean Ian, your your uh, your particular story has this clear br physical brutality ab about what happened for you um, but the courage that that you've shown I'm sure is is is, is way more significant when you've been staring down the demons in in your psychological and social space and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah I think that's really that's really important um, and and can I be cheeky back and suggest that one thing that we we miss is the healthcare professionals need need to be brave actually in in getting alongside you guys and and not, you know, I, I have this I have this big thing about alongside. And as a clinician, I always feel like I'd, uh, I, I don't feel like I want to talk face to face. I want to go and sit next to them on the park bench and just see what it feels like and feel that, you know, somehow. Uh, and that I think for us healthcare professionals, we need to be brave going into that zone as well because it is truly complex. And the I, I am convinced uh, from the work that I've done, I guess my own personal experience of being Lorimer, I'm, I'm convinced that we are extraordinary protection machines, no, organisms, we're not machines, but extraordinarily effective protectors so that, uh, you know, Ian, you can have an experience that your system will get you out of the supermarket. With, and all that, all that that entails, your system makes that happen. And I think, uh, I, we cannot respect that complexity enough. And as a healthcare professional, we, we, if we want to work in in chronic people with with chronic and persistent pain, I think we have to stare down our own demons about what it's like for us when people come in the next week and their lives, and we feel like we haven't offered any anything. And I think we need to be brave as well. And um, so I think. Bravery is everywhere in this space, I reckon. Can I sneak in while I've got the floor, just on a couple of the other things that people were talking of about, course, Ruth? Because I was so yes, excited. Of I was Please so do. excited in what um, what Nina was saying about um, not really unlearning, and that's that's a really demonstrated neuroscientific pr principle of how neural networks and pathways form and. Uh, mold over time that we really learn new things over the top and this idea of seeking out we, we would call them sims which stands for anything that provides evidence of safety in me a sim so we seek we say seek the sims when you find it do it and practice it because we know that neural pathways get better when you practice them and 
Uh, Stacey, you you were talking about that exact journey. As you were talking, I was thinking, this is neuroscience. You are talking neuroscience. You are implementing it. Uh, and and you said that you know you slowly gather those things and you slowly do that, and then you you you're not thinking about the time as much. And you said you, you, your pain is decreasing a bit. You're not really targeting pain relief in what you're doing. What you're targeting are SIMs and these neural pathways that that will, in, in what I spoke about, will start to reduce the size of that overprotective buffer. That's, that's the real problem. Um, anyway, sorry I snuck that. Sorry, I snuck that in. Um, not the at The recovery all, question, I, I totally respect that recovery means different things to different people. And for me, recovery is is a, a positive change, uh, is, a, is a recovery, and I would see it always as a journey. But I think to us uh, healthcare professionals and, and researchers out there, and this might be a controversial thing to say, but I firmly believe it, that, that we have been aiming too low for too long. That we don't we don't aim uh, in a in a direction that I think biology neuroscience clearly tells us we can aim, and the evidence clearly shows that when you do you can get there. And I think it's time for us to be aiming higher, full of respect, full of patience, full of persistence, full of our own courage and and empowering people. But we can aim higher. And what? What a wonderful phrase to finish on. And, and I was going to ask you if you wanted to add anything to kind of round up today, but you've done it beautifully already. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you to um, Lorimer and to the rest of the panel. Um, and before we um, finish, I just want to go through um, a few things before we go today. Um, as you can see on the screen just now, um, your feedback is so important. You'll see um, the code there. You can um, it, to use that or in the question and answer box. There's also a link that you can use to provide feedback there. Um, so please, if you can, I'm kind of pleading, um, take the time to provide feedback um, on either of those methods. Um, just so we can then be able to shape future events. Um, also coming up on the screen in a moment is the telephone helpline for pain concern. And this is a dedicated helpline for anyone who's living in Scotland and who is awaiting for um, an appointment with a pain service. So this is a specific helpline um, just for people who are living in Scotland and waiting for um, an appointment with a pain service. And lastly, People often ask, well, what next? So some resources there for you to look at. You'll see a whole load of information. So do have a look at them. Have a look on social media, on the Flipping Pain social medias um, and the other resources that are listed there. Um, I, I know absolutely how helpful all of those resources are. Um, Steve mentioned earlier the Pain Toolkit. It's, it's there listed as well. Um, and they range from all kinds of resources, charities that support people in pain and different handy toolkits and links to um, different research. So all that remains is for me to say thank you so much for everyone for joining us today and to remember that the next event is on Wednesday the 2nd of March and followed by the last event on Wednesday the 23rd of March. Um, thank you everybody for your contributions and I'll see you then.